everyone, welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, it is definitely going to be a feathery friend of ours, because we are covering the oh-so-wonderful loon. This, of course, is a special listener episode dedicated to Chrissy, Spencer, and Kirsten. Thank you for taking the time to suggest this awesome creature, and I hope you enjoy your episode. To request an animal for the show, you can do so by going to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and clicking on the Animal Request tab. If you love Relax With Animal Facts and would like more of it, including a new exclusive episode every week, that's an extra four episodes per month of Relax With Animal Facts, you can go to patreon.com slash relaxwithanimalfacts. You can also vote on new episodes once per month. This episode is actually a user-voted one, and so you can vote on whatever episode you would like to hear next. A big thank you to George Vlad, who has provided the ambiances for this episode. I have left his YouTube and his website in the description, and I encourage you guys to go check him out. And this is the first episode of Season 7. So at the end of the episode, I am going to be going through a Q&A and also reviewing some of your feedback for how the show can get better. But now we are going to begin to wind down a little bit. If you are new, welcome to the Animal Podcast family. We are very happy to have you. If you are a returning listener, I think you know what I am about to ask of you. I have three primary exhortations for you. The first is that you put on a pair of shoes that you don't mind getting a little wet. We are certainly going to be needing those for where we are going today. And the second thing I encourage you to do is to realize, perhaps, where you are carrying some tension. This is a thing that changes from person to person. It might be in the arms, the legs, the neck, the shoulders. Regardless of where you carry tension, my encouragement to you is the same. Bring up in your mind some jello and do your best to impersonate it. Simply relax whatever it is that is tense for you. And the last thing I encourage you to do is to give your mind permission to wander and journey with me onto a Canadian lake where the loon resides. Canada has some of the most pristine lakes in the world, and it is here on these serene Canadian lakes that the loon loves to reside. We could also, however, have been in the northern United States, that includes Alaska, and they will typically occupy the lakes that are surrounded by forests. During the winter time, they will migrate from these northern lakes to coastal ocean waters. Because loons are migratory, they will stay in one place for some time and then fly to somewhere else, usually for the purpose of breeding. But no matter where they go, they always love to have a huge body of water that they can tap into at any time. The loon in its migration will go to forested lakes and ponds that are in Greenland, Iceland, and northern North America. During the winter time, they will be in the Atlantic coasts and the Pacific coasts of North America, as well as Europe and Iceland. The scientific name of the common loon is the Gavia immer. That word Gavia is a Latin word and it means sea smew. A smew is basically a duck that dives. And the latter word, immer, is actually a Swedish word, and it means dark ashes. This, of course, refers to the color, or the black plumage, of the loon. And so their scientific name suggests a sea-diving duck with a dark ashy plumage. And, of course, this is quite an apt description of the common loon. 
these creatures are well known for one particular reason, and that is their calls. They grace these serene lakes with their own voices, letting out a call that can be distinguished as eerie, almost otherworldly. These birds have quite a unique body shape. They are long and equipped with almost a spear-like beak. All of that is complemented with very deep red eyes. Their body and beak shape allow them to be both very efficient swimmers and divers. In order to dive the way that they do, they very quickly exhale all of the air out of their lungs and flatten their feathers in order to get all of the air out of their plumage. This allows them to dive deep without buoyancy and to swim quickly. And as they are diving and moving around underwater, they are looking for meat. Common loons are carnivores, and they will typically eat things like fish and crayfish, shrimp and leeches, and it is typically rare to see the loon actually consume their prey on the surface. They usually eat all of their prey before they come up to the surface. Biologists estimate that a loon family unit the average is two parents and two chicks, can eat about a half ton of fish over a 15-week period. These creatures can put away fish. Another distinct aspect of the loon is that within their mouth, on the roof of their mouth to be exact, there are rearward pointing projections that basically hold a firm grip on fish that, as we know, can be quite slippery. These sharp little pointy things on the roof of their mouth can lodge themselves under scales and different things of the fish in order to have a steady grip. Loons are not frequently targeted by predators. When they are targeted, however, they will be targeted by creatures like sea otters, bald eagles, and ospreys. They are most commonly prey in the early forms of their life, as little chicks and as they are still within their eggs. Here they are of course the most vulnerable, and so creatures like ravens and raccoons, minks, crows, snapping turtles even, will attempt to go for their eggs for a quick snack. But other than this, because the loon is so adept at diving under the water, they are frequently left alone to do their thing. Now while today we are looking at the common loon, there are four other species. The Pacific loon, the Arctic loon, the red-throated loon, and the yellow-billed loon. Altogether, that makes five loon species. Another amazing anatomical aspect of the loon is that they have solid bones. As we have covered many birds on the show already, we know that many times birds will have hollow bones. This lack of bone density allows them to fly a lot easier as they are carrying less weight. It is why creatures like the flamingo, which looks like a gargantuan bird, can be upwards of only 8 pounds. But by having solid bones, the common loon is much more effective at going through the water than its other counterparts. They are naturally less buoyant, which means they do not have as much resistance as they dive into the water. One last aspect of their anatomy that makes them very effective in the water is the positioning of their legs. Their legs are quite far back on their bodies. This gives them a flipper-like quality when they are in the water, but when they are on land, they will move very awkwardly. This is okay for them, however, because they do not really spend much time on land anyway. They go onto the land to nest, but other than that, they much prefer to be on the water. And as well as loving to be on the water, they also seem to love being under the water. They can hold their breath for up to five minutes, and with their keen red eyes, they can locate prey even underwater. And because of the loon's anatomy, they are kind of like the Boeing 747s of birds. Many birds that we have covered on the show can just take off whenever they want. 
but the loon, due to their solid bones making them relatively heavier, require a longer time to take off. They in fact need some kind of impromptu runway to get off the ground. They need to pick up speed first and then coast along. And one characteristic flight pattern or behavior of the loon that is common to all of them is that their legs, as they are set far back on their bodies, simply trail out behind them. They look like two little air rutters of some kind. It is worth mentioning that the common loon that we are covering right now is larger than the other loon species. Adults are from between 28 to 35 inches, about 70 to 90 centimeters long, and carry a wingspan of 60 inches or 152 centimeters. They will weigh between 3.5 to 17.6 pounds, about 1.6 to 8 kilos. Now let's bring up the flamingo again. The greater flamingo, the larger of the flamingo species, can reach up to 8 pounds in weight, but then take the loon, who seems to be much shorter, and they can get up to 17.6 pounds over double the greater flamingo. This shows us just how relevant and important bone densities are in different birds. Solid bones versus hollow bones make a very substantial difference. Loons are not really social birds. They prefer to be a loon. That is a kind of dad joke that is almost not even a joke. But what's important is that the loon is a fairly solitary creature. That is why during the day you mostly see them alone. But during the night time they will sometimes stick together for survival purposes and they will sometimes group together as well during a migratory journey. And let us shift our focus to one of the most well-known aspects of the loon, their call. Researchers have identified four distinct calls that loons use. Those are the hoot, the yodel, the wail, and the tremolo. The uses of these calls will differ whether in courtship, territorial disputes, communication between pairs and their offspring, different members of the flock, even to signal alarm to other individuals in the group. If you are perhaps not a Canadian and have never heard the cry of the loon, when you have a spare moment, I think it is worth watching a video and listening to their haunting call. Now, loons, like many other birds, are monogamous. This means that there will be one female to one male, and these pairs will typically bond for about five years. During that time, they will only mate with each other, with the females laying their eggs beside large bodies of water or in shallow water. After just two to three days of being born, they can swim and dive, and by 12 weeks, just after three months, they can fly on their own. And as soon as these chicks are able to fly, they will leave their parents and venture out on their own. The chicks will be born with dark, downy feathers and white bellies, and they will sometimes hitch rides on their parents' back for the first 7 to 10 days of their life. The average lifespan of the loon is about 9 years, but sources like National Geographic have reported ages of up to 30 years. The oldest recorded common loon was a female that was at least 29 years and 10 months of age. Now this might very well be an exception to the rule, as it is doubtful that the majority of loons live at such an age. An amazing fact about the loon, given the density of their bones, is how fast they can fly. They can fly at speeds more than 70 miles per hour. We are in Canada, and so we have to do kilometers per hour. That's over 110 kilometers per hour. And now let us move on to the name of the animal. Where does the name come from, or what does it mean? Well, the word loon has been used to describe a large diving bird as early as the 1630s, and it is apparently an alteration of the word loom, which is from a Scandinavian word. 
Now this would make sense as the latter form of their scientific name Immer is a Swedish word and there are some similar aspects to the Norwegian word which is lom and the Old Norse word lomer when used to describe the same creature. And so this is very possible. And so let's kick off season 7 with a Q&A first. Ryan writes, if you were to live in any country in the whole world, where would you live? Now I am going to take this question to mean if I could live anywhere else other than Canada, where would I live? I would likely choose a European country, one that is part of the European Union, as I have a passport, but as to which one, I am not sure. Green writes, if you could be any animal for a day, which would you be? I know I am a big fan of orangutans, but I would say dolphin, specifically a spinner dolphin. They look like they have fun. Darby asks, what's your favorite genre of music? I have grown up my entire life listening to old school hip hop, which I know might seem shocking to many of you, but nowadays my favorite genre is soul music and maybe classical pop guys like Sammy Davis Jr. or Frank Sinatra. Samala asks, what's your favorite animal? Orangutan, hands down. Kate asks, what has been your favorite animal to cover? For me, usually the answer is some sort of primate, but just the most recent episode, which is the donkey, it is animals like that that seem to strike the largest chord with me. I am a huge fan of the underdog and the ordinary, and so probably the donkey. Susie asks, what inspired you to start this podcast? Now, it is true that I love animals, I find them fascinating, but being totally transparent, I was in class in college, and simply the phrase, relax with animal facts, came into my mind, and I said, Hey, that rhymes, maybe people would like to relax with animal facts. That is the honest truth. Amy asks, what's been your favorite part of doing the show? You guys, hands down. It is your feedback, your messages that honestly keeps the show going. You guys are the best listeners anybody could ask for. Kiyumono asks, how does it make you feel when people say they sleep to your podcast? When people frequently write in and say how the show helps them in different ways that includes sleeping, it makes me simply grateful to be hosting the show and to be a part of what makes you feel better. Kiyumono also asks, what's your ultimate goal with the podcast? The podcast's mission statement, so to speak, I would summarize as to instill wonder in others while helping you relax quite simply stated. Kelly asks, what is your favorite animal from Harry, Jupe, age 8? Well, I did already answer that, but I will say again, the orangutan. In fact, I can't say it enough. If you haven't watched the orangutan jungle school on the Smithsonian Magazine channel, that is your homework. WBR asks, what is your favorite bird and why? The shoebill stork, which we covered on the show, because the thing is just a dinosaur. Han asks, what animal do you personally relate to the most? Probably the giraffe, because the giraffe just sleeps 15 minutes at a time all throughout the day, and I'm the kind of guy who can just fall asleep anywhere at any time if I choose. The Red Baron asks, what do you look like? I have gotten that question a lot, and maybe the best answer is a normal dude. I want the show to be about animals and about you guys. I don't want the show to be too focused on me. And so when you think of the show, I'd rather not have you think of me or what I look like, but rather about the animals or about the animal podcast family that you guys are all a part of. But maybe in the future, you guys will know what I look like if I go to, let's say, a podcast convention or something. But that is for the future. Who knows? Expave also asks what my favorite animal is. Again, orangutan. J. Arnold 92 asks, what is my favorite episode so far? And it is almost always the most recent one. And so the donkey or perhaps even the loon. 
Anna asks, how did you come up with the structure of the podcast? Well, the initial structure of the podcast has changed dramatically, where I would put things like references and everything at the beginning of the show, clogging it up. And so I would say that the structure of the show has come about by your feedback and a slow process of trial and error, which you guys like and don't like. And so I almost feel like I have to answer the question, how did you come up with the structure of the podcast by saying, I didn't, you did. Anna also asks, how do you balance working and doing the podcast? For those of you who don't know, I work two jobs and I'm in full-time school in addition to doing the podcast, and so that is why sometimes the episodes are released just a little late. For me, a balance can only be found through correct time management. If I mess up in terms of, let's say, staying on YouTube a little too long, it can throw everything off. And so I guess radical discipline that I often fail in. And the last question comes from Calvin, who asks, How many requests do you get per week? If I was to give a rough estimate, maybe somewhere between 25 to 35, something like that. And now let's move to the feedback, or how the show can be better. Boneskin says, make a mantis shrimp episode. I have to agree, that would make the show better. Darby says, maybe more atmospheric background sound of the animal's natural habitat. Maybe it is important to mention that the ambiance or the atmospheric background wildlife sounds are actually always going after the introduction. They don't go to zero, but they go to about 20% volume. The reason I make it low as I do is that you can hear my voice without having to strain to understand, a practice that might not be so relaxing. And so you can tell if you have headphones on, but if you don't have headphones on, it might sound like after the intro, the ambiance goes to zero, but actually it is still there. Amy has the same request to extend the ambient sounds a little bit, but perhaps I can increase it to 25% volume so that you can still hear it. Vula asks, slow down your talking like you used to. I have noticed that sometimes when I get excited I tend to speak a little bit faster than I'd like, and so that is a good piece of feedback. Manda says, maybe if once a month you could do a special episode, maybe for like prehistoric creatures. Now to this I can only say that we do do special episodes, not just once a month but once a week, but it's on Patreon. And so for specific special episodes, I simply redirect you there. Expave says, I love when episodes are a little bit longer, around 20 to 25 minutes. Well, today you might just get your wish, but it is important to state that sometimes the length of an episode is kind of out of my hands. Certain animals that are less researched or well-known that are requested just won't have a lot of facts on them, and so the length of an episode is actually dependent on the amount of research that is available to me. I'm sure you guys wouldn't want 10 minutes of filler or non-animal facts that wouldn't be too interesting, and so I do my best to have episodes that are, yes, longer, but substantive as well. Arnold says, add a random fun animal fact at the end, not related to the episode's animal. All right, Arnold, what about this? On the Patreon episode on magnetoreception that we just did, we learned that dogs poop in alignment with the Earth's electromagnetic field. That's about as random as it can get. Where's my rain says, make longer episodes. I suppose I have answered that one already. Head first writes, maybe include if animals have symbiotic relationships with other animals. That is a good idea. Many a times animals do in fact have symbiotic relationships with one another, and that would help us see the natural world as more of a system rather than little individual animals. AJ says, please put the list of sources and everything at the end of the episode. 
Well, I have to assume that AJ is actually listening to the older episodes of the show in which the intro would be about 8 minutes long. I wish I could go back and change the format, but I can't. But I think the past maybe 30, 40 episodes, we have completely changed the format in order to have less of an intro and more of things at the end. I don't know what I was thinking on doing that in the first place, but I can't go back in time. And so AJ, my advice would be, just hold out until the later episodes. And that is the end of your feedback. It is amazing to me that we have been on over 150 adventures together. Seven seasons, over three years, and we will keep on going. Thank you for your questions and your feedback. If you would like to request an animal, you can do so by going to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and clicking on the Animal Request tab. If you would like to reach out to me for any other reason, you can do so by sending an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com or by sending a message to relaxwithanimalfacts on Instagram. If you would like four extra Relax With Animal Facts episodes every month, for the price of three cents a day, you can go to patreon.com slash relax with animal facts. A huge thank you to George Vlad for the wildlife ambiances. To check out his work, I have left his YouTube and his website in the description. The resources that were used in today's episode come from livescience.com, nwf.org, allaboutbirds.org, and etimonline.com. All of these resources are in the description or the show notes, and I encourage you to check them out. What an amazing animal we have learned about today. The loon, as a Canadian who has coins in his pocket with a loon on them, these are an animal close to my heart. What a unique bird that roams on the lakes of Canada. I hope you have enjoyed this adventure as much as I have, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode with the next animal. Take care.